Uh, hey everybody, uh, thank you for joining us. I, we know this is probably your lunch hour, so thank you for sharing that with us. I'm Travis Souders. Uh, I'm the social media coordinator here at the Enterprise Record. Um, these are all the newsroom folks from the Chico ER. Um, we will just go ahead with a quick pan to introduce everybody uh, left to right here. Uh, editor David Little, city editor Steve Schoonover, reporter Andre Bayek, Risa Johnson, Laura Ursini, Emily Bertolino, photographer, uh, reporter Heather Hacking, pho photo editor Bill Husa, and then Dan Rydell. So thank you guys for uh, basically ignoring the news for the next 20 to 40 minutes. Um, so, so we are talking today, it is uh, 100 days since uh, the Oroville Dam spillway crisis began. Um, and, and we have some questions we just want to get into and then we'll open that up, uh, open it up to uh, you viewers, if you have questions, you can ask them. Um, I will relay those uh, to these people here. You can ask uh, specifically, or if you have a general question, um, I will just spit that out to these people here. But we'll go ahead and start with uh, with David. Um, David, this is a. I think I thought this was an interesting question, and and basically with a story as big as the spillway, it was a uh, obviously a national nationally covered story. It got really big. Um, this is always an issue for you, and that is the issue of what challenges were there for you in covering such a big event with uh, a relatively small newsroom? Well, uh, it's a good thing there was a Keurig machine and a Dutch Brothers next door because uh, we definitely needed it. A lot of people were working a lot of hours. We had six full-time reporters um, and uh, basically two and a half photographers to cover this. And at the same time, we're trying to cover two counties. Um, there are other things going on in the community, obviously, things like a police shooting occurred in Chico, critical decisions made by city council, fatal traffic accidents, uh, things like this that we obviously have to still cover. So what we did was we threw everybody at it, and uh, it was just a constant juggling and prioritizing and reprioritizing, but the spillway story was obviously the big story and our number one priority for a long time. Um, we did a 100-day retrospective in the print edition today and went back and looked at the last 100 days of front pages and found out that we had 82 front page stories about um, the spillway and its aftermath out of, out of 100. So obviously we hit it with everything we could. Um, one big thing was every media outlet uh, in the world it seemed like was here in Oroville for the first uh, two to seven days, but once um, the evacuation was lifted, uh, things got a lot quieter and then it became our story again. We know that we're going to cover this for a couple of years and um, and other people um, are going to fall off, other media outlets are going to fall off and so therefore um, we knew we had to continue to cover this story and uh, that's what everybody's doing, just chipping in as best they can. Uh, you, you did mention the evacuation, that'll bring us to uh, to Steve, uh, who was he, he was here on February 12th when the emergency um, spillway crisis broke. Um, what's interesting about that is you were the only person who was here when that happened. Um, I believe that was a Sunday, right? Yeah. Uh, Sunday is obviously uh, typically more uh, low staffed than, than other days of the week. Uh, what was that day like for you? Well, I was working because uh, Danny was on vacation, a normal <laughs> Sunday reporter, and uh, mostly it was frustrating. I went to the press conference that the DWR was holding uh, at noon every day at that time and um, heard uh, Bill Croyle and uh, the PR guys talk about how stable the situation was at the spillway, and they must have repeated stable four or five times. So then I went and got some pictures of the spillway and came back to the office and wrote a little short story for the uh, web page that said, everything's fine, and uh, then sat down and fleshed out that story. We were just about ready to publish it when the phone rang, and it was a robocall from uh, DWR saying, the spillway increases have been increased immediately from 55,000 to 100,000 CFS, which didn't really go with stable, mm -hmm. and that was followed up immediately by another robocall from them that said, uh, the spillway is expected to fail within the hour, evacuate immediately, this is not a drill, this is not a drill, this is not a drill. And I didn't particularly want to run with, you know, a mechanized call, but it took 20 minutes to find someone who could confirm that that was legitimate. Uh, DWR wasn't answering their phones. The sheriff's office was swamped. I uh, um, called. I contacted Andre to see if he had any secret numbers for to the sheriff's office, and he did. Uh, he got to the sheriff about the same time I got to a PR guy from um, DWR who confirmed that 
they expected the spillway to fail and they wanted people to get out of there and put the story together and then the website wouldn't <laughs> the website wouldn't take it it just like would not take the story we were able to stick it in a, the breaking news rail on the right side but there's things that run for the hills here and there's a big story here that says everything's fine and it was like that for about two hours until we were able to get some tech to break it free for us yeah, a lot of angles to cover for for one person. <laughs> so uh, that does well, bring us. It was it was it was cool because Andre jumped into the story and uh, Laura and Heather showed up without being asked to come. They just showed up. Everyone knew it was an important story. Everyone wanted to let our readers know what was going on. Definitely, uh, and and that does bring us to uh, to Andre. Um, Andre, what was it like covering those initial hours of the evacuations uh, and and the spillway crisis? Well, for me, uh, jumping on with on what Steve said, it was incredibly confusing. In the, in the first few hours. Um, outside of knowing that some major emergency was, was occurring, uh, it was hard to get reliable information in a timely manner and to get that out to people so they know. I'm sure people who evacuated uh, feel the sa- uh, not, maybe not feel the same way, but were also confused and, and rightfully frightened. Uh, there was a decision at some point where we decided that I should go to Orville from Chico and driving uh, on the highways into Oroville, passing uh, <coughs> gridlock traffic uh, pretty easily going south, as you can imagine. Uh, that's when the gravity situation really set in for me, at least. Uh, uh, that this, was, this was something that, that was a disaster on a grand scale. <laughs> And yeah, it was, like I said, frightening. Uh, when I was in Oroville driving uh, empty streets and trying to get up to, to where law enforcement was staged, uh, you know, when I hit my first roadblock, uh, some traffic cones, I decided to go back uh, to Chico. I was, uh, I was frightened that every official was saying that the emergency spillway was going to fail and that water would rush into the city and downstream. And, uh, Luckily, I did have some good sources. I, I, I could work the phones from the office, and we got some good information eventually. But yeah, no, incredibly confusing, and uh, uh, a big sigh of relief around 8 p.m. or 9, mm-hmm. when uh, the sheriff announced that, that water <laughs> stopped going over that lip. Right, yeah, uh, harrowing, right? Good word for it. Harrowing is good word. <laughs> um, That'll bring us uh, up to, uh, to Risa Johnson. Um, we'll, we'll skip a- ahead a little bit in the timeline because we will actually get to more, um, you know, day of kind of um, angles on this. But, you know, one question that we have for Risa is, um, there, like Steve and Andre mentioned, there were a lot of conflicting reports between what was happening, just how stable the dam was, and, and obviously we're, we're, uh, we were hearing different things at that time. Because of all that, you know, what would you say, like, how is the relationship between um, the Department of Water Resources and you know, City of Oroville, Butte County, how has, have those relationships been affected by the crisis? Yeah, it's interesting because it's a different game for the city and the county. So the county has actually been in a lawsuit with DWR for nearly a decade now. Um, and then they also have a petition in the Third District Court of Appeals. Um, so that basically has not changed since the situation. Um, On the city's end, there's some talk now about possibly exiting the settlement agreement, which um, basically um, calls for about $62 million slowly trickling in through something called the Supplemental Benefits Fund. And that money is eventually going to go to recreational projects, mostly along the Feather River, so mostly benefiting benefiting the city. and at this point, two counselors at least have said that they want to exit the settlement agreement. Um, from my understanding, this is the first time that any counselors have said that they want to do that. Um, it's unclear whether they actually have the legal grounds to do that, so that's being flushed out now. Um, and then the most recent news is there's going to be a town hall on Monday, um, and that's going to be a place for residents to voice their concerns or their opinions um, about the settlement agreement, whether or not they want to stay in it or not. And again, I'm not sure whether they have the legal grounds to, to actually exit that. But that's going to be at 530 um, at the State Theater in Oroville on Monday. Okay. Um, so, so moving on um, to, to Laura, you know, you, uh, you also kind of 
were, were in the scene uh, when the evacuation order um, came. What was your reaction to that on, uh, even just on a personal level? Well, um, I knew that the city editor was working alone here, and um, I had been part of the um, ER coverage of the 2008 fires, and I realized how important having many people in the newsroom during a disaster, not only to keep our readers informed and our through social media, um, but just as support of other people here in the newsroom that were working through that. And I got down here and I kind of handled the social media part of it. Um, and what was it was better than the 2008 fires because we didn't have social media like we do now. And I think we served our readers and our viewers uh, much better. Um, we kept on through information that came out through the police scanners. We monitored uh, Twitter and Facebook. Um, as well as the press releases that were coming in um, just to kind of compile everything as well as we were watching streets, roads, accidents that were happening. We were listening to try to get the evacuees to the best place out of the area while um, really respecting what was going on and how they felt. I mean that's a really scary position to be in. So um, it was everybody worked really hard. It was um, I think David, Stephen, and I were the last ones in the newsroom, and we left about 11.30 that night. And we didn't want to leave. We were afraid something might happen that we might miss. But um, we were all pretty pooped by that time. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we'll move on uh, to Emily. So, so Emily, what was the scene like? Uh, you, you were headed to Orville, basically, as, uh, as all this was happening. What was the scene like in Orville as you were going toward the spillway um, during the evacuation order? Yeah, it started around 4.30 when I got the call from Steve saying that the, evacu the evacuation order was issued. Um, we, so my boyfriend and I hopped in the car and we're driving down Highway 162 where immediately there was cars parked on the side of the roads. Um, a lot of people, not a lot, there were tr people with trailers. We got to the main hub at Lakeside Market that parking lot was completely full. There's already lines out of the parking lot for gas, and I knew that was a good good opportunity to stop and take some photos to show that this is not a normal day, this is not a normal occurrence. We continued on down into Oroville, closer to Montgomery Street and the area that would be first impacted to see if we could get any, um, uh, catch any people packing up, see what they might be grabbing, in those last moments and by then the streets were deserted silent it was quite eerie um, still and then in the distance I heard a police officer coming like over a PA system talking of like this is an evacuation and that's what you heard going through the streets this is an evacuation uh, I don't remember exactly what he was saying but it was kind of scary <laughs> and at that point you know like you know it's time to go move on go to a different spot see what else is happening and there's a press conference happening at the Lake Orville Visitor Center so by then it was dark and we're driving up two TV news vans come rushing by and that was sort of the beginning of the influx of surrounding media national and international the press conference was a different scene where there was felt a lot of uncertainty with the sh if the spillway was going or excuse me the emergency spillway was going to collapse um, was the evacuation order necessary helicopters flying overhead and just uncertainty in what this all was going to bring and that was kind of the scene in those first initial hours mm -hmm. but, yeah. um, so so speaking of the evacuation Heather um, you were part of the coverage of, of both the evacuation and uh, the evacuees, like once they had found a place to go. What was the vibe that you got from those people? Um, obviously, uh, like, sure, surely had to be really emotional. Um, what was that like for you? I picked up the story after the, the scenes that Emily described, and, and I actually got there um, when the emergency crew was just setting up, so it was not quite dark yet. So people were just showing, people were just showing up when I got over to the fairgrounds. And I think people were really in shock. They had been rushed out of their house. They'd gone through hours of traffic to get there. Um, things were just like it took them a long time to get through traffic to get to Chico. It took a while for Red Cross to get set up, so there was a lot of uncertainty. 
Um, surprisingly, people, maybe they were in shock, but people were, were pretty low-key. There wasn't fights that were breaking out or anything like that. And just to remember, you know, the people who came to the evacuation area were people who didn't go to their cousin's sister's home or somebody that they met on Facebook. So these were people that, you know, they, they came like they were told to this place. And um, there was 1,800 people at the peak, and obviously a lot more people were evacuated than that. Um, we went over every day and um, talked with people. There was, um, you know, they were getting tired and, and frustrated and, and were worried about their homes, worried about their pets, um, really worried about their pets. Some people had their dogs in their car because they couldn't leave them. I could go on and on and on with the stories. But, it, you know, about the third day, it was Valentine's Day, and the community had really gone, oh, how can we help and found out how they can help and that day was great um, there was face painting for kids and and people were really in the community were really trying to make this a happier place for evacuees but that was the last day and um, there was rumors that the the mandatory evacuation might be lifted and people sort of heard about that and started to leave kind of before it went over the loudspeaker and so a lot of people were just really antsy to get out of there and check check in on their homes and then there was people I talked to who were still afraid to go back um, one lady said she she lives in the face of the dam and she wasn't going to go back until she was absolutely certain that um, that it would be safe for her so there was yeah a lot of emotions and a lot of different stories there uh, we'll move on to uh, to Bill and Bill as a photographer you run into access problems all the time specifically with this one what challenges have you experienced in trying to accurately document the spillway situation um, specifically in regards to access to get into where you need to be access has been difficult and it was difficult in the beginning and it remains difficult today um, the very first day that we heard that there was an issue with the spillway. I tried to get to the spillway and the road was already blocked off. Uh, myself and Rick Carhart and uh, Mr. Leeds from TV stations here all waited for a DWR guy that they said was gonna show up at the roadblock to bring us in and fill us in. Waited for about 15 or 20 minutes and nobody showed up. So we all went our separate ways and I went around the other side and eventually made my way to the Brad Freeman Trail where I hiked in and got a view of the spillway and was somewhat shocked at what I saw and uh, shot that, got it back, got the photos out and, uh, and then it was blocked off at the dam and it's been blocked off at the dam ever since then. So access for working media is bad it's really bad and it uh, should be changed because I think people are having trust issues getting all of their images fed from DWR it's kind of like having the guard at the prison show you all the photos from inside the prison well, <laughs> you know uh, any news media being allowed in there and having full access would be better than what we currently have I hope that will change in the future uh, from one photographer to another, uh, Dan. So, so one of the things Bill mentioned is, you know, he was pretty pretty shocked at what he saw. Um, I get the feeling that not a lot of people grasp just how huge the spillway is. Um, can you give us a sense of scale of of like what that scene is like? Yeah. So I mean, every time I go out there, I'm blown away by how big it is. Um, and we've covered it in the past. We've been there um, before all this happened, you know, and and it's still huge, and it just. The, the scale is, is incredible. I mean, it's um, like 1,700 feet from the gate to the bottom. That's more than a quarter mile, that's huge. Um, and then uh, you can see in some of the pictures where there's people working on it, you know, those are normal sized people and they look like tiny little dots. Um, it, it's incredible. Those baffles at the bottom are I think like 30 feet high. So, you know, this is it's 10 feet to our ceiling, three <laughs> times that. And that concrete, that huge concrete there is that big. Um, the trees on the side are like enormous trees. They're not, they're not little saplings. They're 40 feet tall trees, you know, hanging over these 25 foot tall walls. It's, it's incredible. It, it's so big every time I go out there. And it's loud when the water's rushing. Um, it's incredibly loud. There's spray everywhere. It's, it's huge. It's really, really big. It, it's hard to, 
to show that in the pictures because every time I look at the pictures that we take that Bill's taken and I've taken you know you can't you just don't see the scale as when you're standing right there looking up at it right right and we so so we tried to do the math right and and you know caution journalists doing the math but we <laughs> it, we figured out what was like sit if you took uh, 600 six foot people standing on each other's shoulders you'd you'd get roughly the height is that about right uh, I think it's or more than that yeah I think that's the length yeah. <laughs> the length right right yeah, yeah so, so it's big like that. <laughs> um, but actually I was th- Steve and I talked about when we, when we ha- we have a picture of you know what looks like a hole you know a couple weeks before that bill took a couple weeks before everything happened and that little tiny dot on the spillway is you know six eight ten feet across it's mm-hmm. it's it looks like that big in the pictures and it's ten feet wide it's as, probably as big as this table here right or right bigger. yeah okay well you know that that wraps up our questions uh, that we uh, kind of softballed to each other um, you know for, for those of you who are watching uh, thank you for sticking with us this long um, we want to open this up right now uh, for as long as there are people interested to answer any of your questions go ahead and put them uh, in the comments for us and and we will pass those along um, if not we will uh, we'll do just like you want to do and we'll go get some lunch um, but so so for right now, you know, there there are a couple of follow-ups um, that I wanted to have specifically for Steve and David. Neither of you can take these, and that has been, um, you know, we talked about this briefly, and that's been the access and and trust issues with DWR. Um, what's your take on on how that's played out? In, in other words, when they started, basically, um, from the beginning of this to right now, we, I feel like we don't necessarily have the best idea of what's going on, um, and, and that's in large part because of DWR. Well, I, th- I think one thing people need to realize is that it didn't start with this incident. Um, there was a, a, an incident at the Hyatt Power Plant, um, I think it was seven years ago, um, where five workers got injured, one horribly injured, and we were told nothing about the incident. So um, the distrust, uh, well, it started before that, but it grew there. Um, then there was a, a power plant fire uh, in Thermal Edo, uh, same thing, couldn't get any information. Um, and uh, for a public agency to act that way towards news media, which represents the public, um, it's, it's really surprising. And so when this started and we uh, had trouble getting information and getting the true story and especially getting access to see for ourselves what's really going on, um, you can't help but wonder what's really going on. <laughs> yeah, if you have anything. Uh, to their to their credit, DWR does seem to be doing some things uh, a little better than they were. But um, like Bill says, you can't get to it. Um, you, you know, calls aren't returned. You can't talk to the experts on the matter. You you have to send them emails to a PR person who asks the question to the expert that you really wanted to talk to directly. And then you get an answer to a question you didn't ask. It's uh, it's very very frustrating. Um, I think they know they have a problem and they are trying to fix it, but they got a long ways to go. Sure. Well, we're, so we're really glad that the sheriff got involved in providing information because he's been great about it. Right. Right. So one question that I have, um, or or something that I'm interested in, is especially in in the breaking news cycle and this is maybe it's more of a general uh, a general question but for this specific situation i think we saw firsthand uh, how hard it can be to keep information flowing um, but also keep it accurate because we also saw a lot of news sources that didn't seem to be concerned with being accurate Um, we saw people saying the dam was collapsing that's not true we saw people saying that the dam was overflowing also not true um how hard is it to compete like in in that um in that scenario where where you really are kind of fighting against white noise well the frustrating thing to me uh, about that was those were all from national media sources that have a much bigger audience than we normally do um and and they should know better but all the inaccuracies stem from somebody sitting in a desk in newport beach california saying that the dam is broken when it's not the dam it's the spillway and and uh you know breitbart was one of them fox news channel was one of them newsweek was one of them CNN. they all cnn all delivering inaccuracies and and all all of which had no reporters on the ground here um and i think a lot of people um probably media connoisseurs learned um that you trust the people who are there on the ground not the people who are 
spreading rumors from 700 miles away. Another thing is, you know, uh, our, our primary concern is our people here, our readers, and I think most of them know um, that we're going to give them good information or, as I said, we I wasn't going to go with that robocall right off the bat. <laughs> we need to have, need to confirm things and um, I think they know they can trust us. Um, I, I want to switch this really quick to uh, Risa and Emily. Both of you spend the, the majority of your time in Oroville dealing with Oroville issues. I want, I'm interested to know how, how the dam situation has affected the rest of your coverage in Oroville, how maybe um, you know, city council meetings are affected. Like, how, how big of an issue is this um, in relation to everything else that's going on? We'll, we'll start with you, Risa. Yeah, um, it kind of overshadows everything going on in Oroville right now. Um, it's come up at... I believe every city council meeting probably since it since it happened um, they're talking about you know how they're gonna get federal aid state aid um, talking about how they can get the attention of, of officials um, like one of the counselors Scott Thompson is going to the White House soon for something unrelated but he he wants to give a letter try to get a letter to President Trump to get to get more attention um, so it's just it's constantly it's it's overshadowing everything that's going on there. Hmm. Uh, Emily, same question, but I through the uh, the lens, pardon the pun, of being a photographer um, in Oroville these days. Once again, it is kind of overshadowed everything, and going in and seeing how it is has affected the community has been really interesting. With uh, in the beginning, the constant trucks coming and going, and how that really tore up the roads and created traffic issues for people who are normally going down certain roads had to get rerouted and the uh, seeing that and how it's affected the community has changed my perspective of what I needs to be covered within Oroville. Okay, well, we are coming up here on just about 50 minutes. Uh, we don't see any more questions coming in from uh, from our viewers. I think this is a good time to go ahead and wrap it up. Uh, thank you to everybody um, in, in the ER newsroom. Obviously, I'm, uh, I'm able to see uh, all the work that these people have done uh, through the last three months or so. Um, pretty incredible stuff to, to witness firsthand. Um, so I hope that you got to get a taste of that, of, of kind of what the inside scene has been like uh, as we've covered the Orville Dam Spillway crisis. Uh, thank you for those of you who stuck around to watch, and uh, we will have more Orville coverage of the dam, of course, uh, probably until the end of time. Uh, <laughs> ChicoYard.com, OrvilleMR.com. Thank you, guys.